Okay. Uh, our next speaker is Aditya, Aditya Pandare from, the, uh, from North Carolina State University. Um, and he'll be talking about discontinuous scleric and finite element methods uh, on Chunk++. Plus Plus. Hello. Uh, thanks for the introduction. So um, this work is in collaboration with uh, Los Alamos National Lab. Uh, it's something I'm working on with uh, my PhD advisor, Dr. Hong Luo. And uh, I'm here to report my, our progress towards the development of a DG method based on a native charm uh, uh, native charm code. So uh, the way I'm going to proceed in this presentation is first I'm going to talk about the platform which Joseph talked about yesterday, the Kinua uh, code. Uh, after that I'll follow it by the physical system that we are trying to solve, then the numerical approximations needed to solve the physical system. Um, then we'll go a little bit into the details of the considerations for parallel computation for DG methods. Uh, I'll end it, uh, wrap it up with some examples after that. So uh, the code that we are working on is written in modern C++ and in native charm++. It is fully asynchronous uh, parallel programming, uh, extensive unit and regression tested. So basically it's a production style code. It takes time to um, implement such things cleanly uh, in, in this kind of a code. So. Uh, the current capabilities of this code before we started off with the DG methods was uh, it was able to handle continuous Galerikian solvers for uh, compressible fluid flow. Uh, the kind of meshes which were uh, being used were tetrahedral meshes, fully unstructured tets, and the, it also has a capability to solve stochastic differential uh, equations for particles. Uh, the key feature of this code which we are trying to exploit, uh, and uh, of CHAM++ of course, is the dynamic load balancing uh, capabilities uh, using the over decomposition strategy. We'll talk about this more as we, as we proceed. Uh, for now, let's look at the physical system that we are trying to solve. Uh, the transport equation can be looked at, uh, can be described as a partial differential equation uh, in time and space uh, coordinates. So uh, that one on the top is, is the, uh, this is the partial differential equation. But in general, we do not have an exact solution to such an equation. So what we do is we try a numerical approximation. We try to solve this partial differential equation in a weak form, a weak integral form. For that, uh, I'm just going through quickly through the uh, math of this. So. First, we multiply by a test function here, uh, and then integrate over the physical domain that we are trying to compute the problem on. So what we end up, after, after using integration by parts or for this space derivative, what we end up is, with is this uh, integral form over the entire domain. Now, this is where the numerical approximation for the solution comes in. This u is the exact solution, which we cannot find out. So what, what we are trying to do is, for every mesh element, we describe this solution as a, uh, as a linear combination, basically. Uh, the B is a basis function. So if we are describing the solution as a polynomial, this basis function will be, basic, uh, this basis function will be the kind of polynomial. So for example, that this might be Legendre polynomials, Taylor basis functions, whatever you can cook up. And the ui is the coefficient which will be different for each element. And the ui, mind you, is not dependent on the spatial coordinates. It is the basis function that is dependent on the spatial coordinates. So if we look at the numerical, numerical approximation of this u, it can be written as uh. H usually stands for uh, the, the mesh size. So that's why it's a uh here. And we can describe this UH as a summation over the number of bases that we have. Uh, and the, the most important part of mo uh, most of the, or all of the uh, finite element methods is that BI should be a compact support. So basically, the solution, the, uh, the polynomial over here will depend only on the coefficients of that particular, on that particular element, not anywhere else. Uh, to describe, to visualize what the discontinuous Galerikian method looks like in one dimension, 
we just look at these, these four examples I've given here. So let's look at P0. So it's, we describe solutions in each cell by constants, constant values. And this is basically what the classical finite volume method does, right? First order. What we're assuming bi to be here is one. So basically the, uh, the solution, the, uh, the coefficient that we were talking about over here represents the cell average, and that is the solution itself. So that is represented by the red lines on these two cells. So let's say that these two are cells in 1D. So the red lines over here describe the P0 solution. Uh, as you can see, at the cell interface, or, or at the cell boundary, the solutions are discontinuous. That's why it's called the discontinuous Galerkin method. Now if we go higher, so if we want to describe a linear solution, we go to P1 approximations. The green lines here show P1 approximations, so the solution is linear. Now it's not constant over cells. So the first degree of freedom is not the entire solution in the cell. The first, the second, together would, bring, would give you the total or the, the actual solution in the cell. Even, even though it is linear, you will see that there is a discontinuity over here. So if you look at the cell face, there are two values there. It's not, it's not unique. And that is characteristic of the DG method. This would not be the case for the conventional finite element methods where these two would be stuck together. You know, there wouldn't be this discontinuity in, in, in the solution at the cell interface. We could go on higher and higher uh, trying to describe solutions using quadratic, qu uh, I mean, uh, quadratic, uh, cubic, quartic functions. Over here, I've shown a quadratic function in blue. Even there, the solution is discontinuous. I've not shown a uh, cubic function here, just otherwise this, this figure would even be more messy. Right, so now we know what a DG solution looks like in 1D. Uh, now, if, if you remember, what we have over here is over the entire domain, the physical domain, but this is on each cell. So now we need to, this is, so this is not a complete, this is the semi-discrete system. Now we, we want to discretize the system completely, and this is how we do it. Now the integrals are on each cell, and since, uh, since this bi is not a function of time, so the basis function is not a function of time in our specific case, we pull it out of the time derivative and we get something like this over here and this is called as the this is called the mass matrix and and the rest of the terms are basically written in a similar way just to uh, the, the only difference is of course that all the functions of the solution are now uh, are now functions of the comp or the numerical solution here every u is replaced by uh and this is just the source term so if you want to just look at the system we are trying to solve the the ax equal to b kind of system this is the system that we are trying to solve for u's. And these u's are coefficients. They are not the solution directly. You have to plug it in with the basis functions in, in their linear combinations to get, um, to get the actual solution. So anyway, we are trying to solve for this ui. So for Galerkin type of finite element methods, the test function that I was talking about is equal to the basis function, and that's, uh, that's uh, that's the speciality of the Galerkin type uh, finite element methods, which we are trying to use here. Uh, and the special case is obviously the first order approximation, which is the standard conventional finite volume method, where actually this guy just drops out because this is one. So what we have to solve is basically just this equation, which most of, most of the CFD people will be familiar with. So right now, we are at a stage where we have implemented the finite volume version into uh, the Kinoa code. Let's look at what u can be. So let's get a perspective of what we are trying to solve here, right? Because we, we do all these things for what? So the point is we are trying to solve something complicated like, well, not really complicated, but uh, something physical like the Euler equations of gas dynamics, for example. Uh, we have in, in 3D, we have five unknowns. So we have three components of velocities. So five unknowns, then this is the the kind of flux f that we are looking at. But in a simpler sense, we can also look at a scalar equation, right? Uh, just to make sure that we have everything in order. Uh, that is what we, we, have, uh, we are uh, presenting today, just a scalar equation. But this is just an example for you to see what kind of systems we can solve. Uh, looking at the time integration, so 
the time derivative over here is still not discretized. We have a derivative term over here, right? We need to do something about that. So for that, we just use explicit uh, forward Euler discretization, first order, nothing fancy here. Um, so th th there is nothing new or, new or fancy over here. So basically what happens in a time step is we first compute a, an allowable time step from the CFL criterion. Then we compute the right-hand side, which is the most computation intensive part. Uh, the right-hand side will consist of all the flux uh, terms, which might be surface integrals or the volume integrals. Once we get that, we can update the vectors, uh, the solution vectors, just in the, using this algebraic equation. Uh, the good part about uh, our implementation right now is time stepping is done without any global reductions. And uh, we, we just use the SDAC to uh, specify dependencies on the necessary parts, but there is no global uh, reduction in, in any of the time, uh, time stepping stage right now. Uh, so we, let's talk more about this stage because that's the most co uh, computation intensive stage. We need to compute the uh, fluxes or the integrals on the surfaces. The problem with DG method is obviously that the values are not unique. So what value do we take on cell interfaces, right? So that's where the Riemann solver comes into a picture where we use the values on the left and the right side of the interface to get a unique value for the flux. That unique value is determined, like I said, by the Riemann solver. There are different considerations that go into designing a Riemann solver. It might be related to physics. It might be related to just accuracy. Uh, there are quite a few of them. But right now, since we are doing only a scalar equation, you don't have too many. You can't do too many things. So it's just upwind, downwind, and central differencing. So my point is that when we compute this flux, we need both the left state and the right state. Now, in this picture, it's obvious why that is why I'm bringing that up, it's because if there, is a, if there is a processor boundary and we need to compute the flux across this processor boundary, we would need to transfer data from, from uh, we would need to communicate the data from processor I to processor J. And this is fairly regular, but when we go to higher order, this, might, this is going to become more important. So basically, let's look at what communication patterns or what communication information we need right now. Right now, we just need the outer element ID. So basically, if I'm on processor J, for example, I would need the I cell ID of this guy. Uh, then I would need the geometry information, like maybe the volume of this cell, uh, maybe the coordinates for high order reconstructions. And we would also need the solution of uh, that cell because that would help us solve the Riemann problem there. So basically what I'm saying over here is the, the communication, the successful communication depends on the, the correct communication map that we set up across processor boundaries. Uh, that points us to the derived data structure, which is usually, usually a pre-processing step uh, in most CFD codes. Uh, just a review of what all you usually require in a serial code is that we need elements surrounding elements, uh, we need elements surrounding faces. We need vertices, uh, vertices of faces to get the reconstructions. Uh, that is the higher order terms. So basically, these things are, as usual, required in any serial code too. Additionally, data structures that are required for parallel communication are basically uh, the, the partition face IDs. So basically, when we have a partition, we need to assign a face ID to the partition that to the face on the par uh, processor partition that we are talking about. And we need to associate this with the correct elements both on the other processor and on this processor. Otherwise, when we are looping over faces to compute the Riemann flux, we do not know which element is on, on this processor and on the other processor. So we need a communication step over here to match the, the face so that we know that, yes, the element on the other side of the face is really J, let's say. And I am I, so that is J. And once we have that, we would need, uh, we would need the solution from, uh, from that cell J. And th that's basically the second point that I'm trying to make over here. 
So I have some uh, prelim uh, once all of this communication is set up, we try to run a few preliminary tests for advection of a Gaussian hump in, in, three, in 2D, but this is using a 3D mesh, a 3D tetrahedron mesh. So we are, we are trying to see what happens when we give a uniform velocity. So as you can see, the Gaussian hump is advected uh, diagonally because that's the velocity vector that I give it. And there is diffusion, obviously, because of the numerical approximation that we're looking here. So however, it, it's crossed a lot of, uh, so we are, use, we are using four or eight and 16 processors to check this. And there are obviously a lot of processor boundaries that this hump is crossing. And there is no uh, noise or there, there's, there's no defect because of crossing the processor boundaries, which makes us think that uh, yes, whatever communication patterns that we have um, implemented are okay. The next thing that we are trying to do over here, now this is, this is a little uh, difficult to explain. So we are trying to fake computational load. Since right now the load is pretty much balanced, what we are trying to do is give some excess, communication, uh, some excess computation to some one uh, zone in the domain, so that once we do that, uh, there is actually a load imbalance. Once that happens, we want to see how Cham++ is able to migrate the chairs over. And what, the, the way I'm trying to do this over here is, uh, there are four processors. Um, let's. So over here, as you can see, it started off with a fairly, uh, with, with a uniform, uh, let's see if I can play it again. Wow, I cannot. So basically, it starts off with a uniform, uh, distribution, so this is processor one, two, three, and four. But what I've done is in this zone, in this zone over here, I have given extra computations. They are not contributing any way to the numerical solution. What I just want to do is give it some stupid calculations to do and see if Cham++ is indeed able to migrate stuff and reduce the computation time. And as you can see, the final result is that a lot of uh, migration has actually happened. So I'm coloring by processor number right now. And as you can see, a lot of other processors are pitching in over here to make the job for processor number one uh, easier. That's basically what we wanted to see. And I, uh, once I did this, of course, the numbers are um, for just one test case. But I, uh, I found a 40% reduction in uh, computation time once I turned on load balancing. So that's, uh, that is what we are looking at. We want to actually see whether doing this really works. Because eventually, if we write everything, write up the whole code, and then if the load balancing is not uh, helping us, then that's, that's really useless for us. So that's why we wanted to make sure that it works, and it does. So that's, that's what I want to show over here. Okay. All right. So, the future roadmap, like I said, we are just starting up, uh, starting off with this project. We have a first order code set up. Right now, we actually also have the Euler equation set up. I have not shown the results here. But how are we planning to proceed? So like I said, the extension to coupled system of PDEs like Euler equations, now we have Stokes equations. So basically, more and more physically relevant or practically relevant stuff. That's one thing. But more importantly, we want to move on to high order DG methods. And why this is important is for P refinement. Uh, I'll, I'll show you in the next, next slide why P refinement is important. So uh, disclaimer here, this is, not, uh, this is not from the Quinoa code. This is from my PhD thesis. So over here, what I'm trying to show is there is a shock crossing over a bubble. So this, this is in water, and this is air. And what's going to happen is in any, in any CFD code, the computations near the shock and near the multiphase interface are going to be so high that if we do if the, if we do this in a parallel fashion the node which has this uh, this part of the domain is going to lag behind and it's going to slow everything down the others are just going to be idle and waiting for it so ideally what we want to do is over decompose even this part of the domain so that the other processors pitch in and the load balancing reduces the amount of time that is required to uh, that's required to, for this simulation. So it is, the, the, since this is, not, uh, this is not from this particular code, I, I'm, I'm showing this picture so, so that you, uh, you guys know what we are aiming at eventually. That's our target. That, that's, uh, that's our goal over here.
Um, so what would, be look, what would we be looking at for high order DG? Why would the load be really unbalanced for high order DG? So the, the point is at volume and surface integrals, since we don't have a piecewise constant uh, uh, data, we would want to have the numerical integration be more accurate. And for this, we use quadrature, Gaussian quadrature. And as the order of the uh, DG goes on increasing, we need more quadrature points. And that's how the load is going to be uh, unbalanced, basically. Because if, if we do a peer refinement at zones where there is a lot of, uh, lot of gradients in solutions, for example, a lot of high errors, that's where the uh, peer refinement will come into picture. And that's where the Gaussian quadrature will go on increasing. And uh, that's how the load is going to be unbalanced. And the computational effort per element will increase. And that's how we, we want to look at the load balancing scenario here. Uh, so like I said, the P adaptation leads to more number. Uh, oh, yeah, so I forgot about this. So as the P adaptation, uh, as we increase the order in P, the number of DOFs that we are solving for also increases. So we are solving for more unknowns in some zones. And some processors are left with lesser unknowns to solve. So that's, that's the cause of load imbalance. And the Gaussian quadrature is another cause of load uh, imbalance. So uh, also, there are other possible sources, like I said, explicit, uh, expensive limiting strategies to, uh, to make sure that uh, the solution does not diverge for highly nonlinear problems, like I just showed you. So these are the kind of problems that we are trying to tackle. And we are trying to see if the load balancing is really going to help us uh, to solve those problems more efficiently. To summarize, I went through the ongoing development of a high order uh, P adaptive DG scheme. Uh, and I tried to explore some dynamic load balancing using over decomposition and migration using JAM++. And uh, I just want to mention here that this is very production style coding. So uh, it's going to take some time to get there. But it seems that we are on a good path. All right, thank you. Uh, I, I'm somewhat surprised that you the P0 and PN case are handled differently. Uh, isn't it just a different matrix multiply? And so couldn't you just have, like the way we have it, you just change a number. Um, and then it, it, right, it just increases the size of the matrices. Or, or is that different for tets than for... Um, can you say that? What do you mean when you I, say that they're handled differently? I, I, I well, it seems like you said you have P, P0, but for us, when we implemented, we just implemented PN right away. Right, and and right. There was no, there's no difference because it's just the size of the matrices are larger or smaller. But, right. So that's why. Is, is, is it how's the design so that that's special or different? It's, or? it's not different in any way. The only reason why I showed you this, uh, this particular slide um, you know, this one, this is what you're talking about, right? No, no, I'm saying that you were saying that in your code, you currently only have P0. Right, right. So I have not uh, implemented the higher order stuff yet. So right now, it's just P0. What is it, that to implement this Right, like, f it, it, it's just a different matrix, right? That's what's there to implement. I okay. haven't implemented the, for example, the basis function architecture or, or the basis function uh, basis functions mechanisms okay. they have not been implemented yet okay so that's i think i think what you're asking is <laughs> we have implemented p0 why didn't we implement pn and where n can be any integer yeah. that's what these guys did and good question i think so too but uh, we are not interested in all the n's this is the first step and we want to do p1 p2 if I'm correct, right? P1, P2, and that's really all we care about. Nothing higher than that, nothing really lower. This is the first step. It's not going to be very useful yet. But it's really what we want to have is P1, P2. And beyond that, P refinement, of course, for which it makes sense what you're saying. But right. as, uh, uh, our goal at this point is to do P1, P2. Right. right. Okay. Just stay to P1, P2, so reconstructed uh, DG, RDG. Uh, so we'll, we'll have probably four options in there, P0, P1, P1, P2, 
maybe P0, P1. So it's like we don't do actual P2, we do a reconstruction to P2. So those kind of options is what we are looking at. So these are specific cases and not necessarily a generically treatable. I, get, I mean, I don't know enough about it to, to, to say, but right, it but seems like that's going to be that's, the case. That's what, that, that is what it is, yeah. yeah. So just an additional comments to address your question, why it's not P and at the very beginning, but just P0. I think from Aditya's learning curve, the first challenge is how to extend from an existing code structure and create something, some geometry structure, which is originally missing, just the loop over the faces, because he started with Joseph's code, which is a continuum FEM code without loop over faces. Just the work on creating the fundamental structure will take a lot after the first so but there basically there is no technical difficulty difference between you using p0 or higher order i mean but uh, for his the biggest the contribution so far is to build up a dg fundamental framework in order to do more work so i think yeah hope that can help you understand that yeah thanks for that that's basically what what the point is so once we have the framework you're right, just the matrix, right? Just just increasing the number of unknowns and dealing with that. So, but to, to create the fund, fundamental structure on which we can build a DG framework, that's what I've been working on right now. And if you do that for DG P0, doing that for P1, 2, is, is okay. That's, that's what it is. Thanks.